Secret Chambers and Hiding Places Historic, Romantic and Legendary Stories and Traditions About Hiding Holes, Secret Chambers, etc. By Alan Fee Introduction The Secret Chamber is unrivaled even by the haunted house for the mystery and romance surrounding it. Volumes have been written about the haunted house, while the secret chamber has found but few exponents. The ancestral ghost has had his day, and to all intents and purposes is dead, notwithstanding the existence of the Psychical Society and the investigations of Mr. Stead and the late Lord Bute. Alas, poor ghost! He is treated with scorn and derision by the multitude in these advanced days of modern enlightenment. The searchlight of science has penetrated even into his sacred haunts, until, no longer having a leg to stand upon, he has fallen from the exalted position he occupied for centuries, and fallen, moreover, into ridicule. In the secret chamber, however, we have something tangible to deal with, a subject not only keenly interesting from an antiquarian point of view, but one deserving the attention of the general reader, for in exploring the gloomy hiding-holes, concealed apartments, passages and staircases, in our old halls and manor-houses, we probe, as it were, into the very groundwork of romance. We find actuality to support the weird and mysterious stories of fiction, which those of us who are honest enough to admit a lingering love of the marvellous must now doubly appreciate, from the fact that our school-day impressions of such things are not only revived, but are strengthened with the semblance of truth. Truly, Bishop Copleston wrote, If the things we hear told be avowedly fictitious, and yet curious or affecting or entertaining, we may indeed admire the author of the fiction and may take pleasure in contemplating the exercise of his skill. But this is a pleasure of another kind, a pleasure wholly distinct from that which is derived from discovering what was unknown, or clearing up what was doubtful. And even when the narrative is in its own nature, such as to please us and to engage our attention, how greatly is the interest increased if we place entire confidence in its truth! Who has not heard from a child when listening to a tale of deep interest? Who has not often heard the artless and eager question, Is it true? From Horace Walpole, Mrs. Radcliffe, Scott, Victor Hugo, Dumas, Lytton, Ainsworth, Le Fanu, and Mrs. Henry Wood, down to the latest up-to-date novelists of today, the secret chamber an ingenious necessity of the good old times, has afforded invaluable property. Indeed, in many instances the whole vitality of a plot is, like its ingenious opening, hinged upon the masked wall, behind which lay concealed what hidden mysteries, what undreamed-of revelations. The thread of the story, like Fair Rosamund's silken clue, leads up to, and at length reveals, the buried secret, and, unlike the above comparison in this instance, all ends happily. Bulwer Lytton honestly confesses that the spirit of romance in his novels was greatly due to their having been written at my ancestral home, Nebworth, Hearts. How could I help writing romances? he says, after living amongst the secret panels and hiding-places of our dear old home. How often have I trembled with fear at the sound of my own footsteps, when I ventured into the picture-gallery! How fearfully have I glanced at the faces of my ancestors, as I peered into the shadowy abysses of the secret chamber! It was years before I could venture inside, without my hair literally bristling with terror. What would Woodstock be, without the mysterious picture? Peveril of the Peak, without the sliding panel? the Castlewood of Esmond, without Father Holt's concealed apartments, ninety-three, Marguerite de Valois, the Tower of London, Guy Fawkes, and countless other novels of the same type, without the convenient contrivances of which the dramatis personae make such effectual use. 
Apart, however, from the importance of the secret chamber in fiction, it is closely associated with many an important historical event. The stories of the gunpowder plot, Charles II's escape from Worcester, the Jacobite risings of 1715 and 1745, and many another stirring episode in the annals of our country speak of the service it rendered to fugitives in the last extremity of danger. When we inspect the actual walls of these confined spaces that saved the lives of our ancestors, how vividly we can realize the hardships they must have endured. And in wondering at the mingled ingenuity and simplicity of construction, there is also a certain amount of comfort to be derived from drawing a comparison between those troublous and our own more peaceful times. CHAPTER One, A GREAT DEVISER OF PRIEST'S HOLES During the deadly feuds which existed in the Middle Ages, when no man was secure from spies and traitors even within the walls of his own house, it is no matter of wonder that the castles and mansions of the powerful and wealthy were usually provided with some precaution in the event of a sudden surprise, that is to say, a secret means of concealment or escape that could be used at a moment's notice. But the majority of secret chambers and hiding places in our ancient buildings owe their origin to religious persecution, particularly during the reign of Elizabeth, when the most stringent laws and oppressive burdens were inflicted upon all persons who professed the tenets of the Church of Rome. In the first years of the Virgin Queen's reign, all who clung to the older forms of the Catholic faith were mercifully connived at, so long as they solemnized their own religious rites within their private dwelling-houses. But after the Roman Catholic rising in the north, and numerous other popish plots, the utmost severity of the law was enforced, particularly against seminarists whose chief object was, as was generally believed, to stir up their disciples in England against the Protestant Queen. An act was passed prohibiting a member of the Church of Rome from celebrating the rites of his religion on pain of forfeiture for the first offence, a year's imprisonment for the second, and imprisonment for life for the third. Footnote. In December 1591, a priest was hanged before the door of a house in Gray's Inn Fields, for having there said Mass the month previously. End of footnote. All those who refused to take the oath of supremacy were called recusants, and were guilty of high treason. A law was also enacted which provided that if any papist should convert a Protestant to the Church of Rome, both should suffer death as for high treason. The sanguinary laws against seminary priests and recusants were enforced with the greatest severity after the discovery of the gunpowder plot. These were revived for a period in Charles II's reign, when Oates's plot worked up a fanatical hatred against all professors of the ancient faith. In the mansions of the old Roman Catholic families, we often find an apartment in a secluded part of the house, or garret in the roof, named the chapel where religious rites could be performed with the utmost privacy, and close handy was usually an artfully contrived hiding-place, not only for the officiating priest to slip into in case of emergency, but also where the vestments, sacred vessels, and altar furniture could be put away at a moment's notice. It appears from the writings of Father Tanner that most of the hiding-places for priests, usually called priests' holes, were invented and constructed by the Jesuit Nicholas Owen, a servant of Father Garnet, who devoted the greater part of his life to constructing these places in the principal Roman Catholic houses all over England. With incomparable skill, says an authority, he knew how to conduct priests to a place of safety along subterranean passages, to hide them between walls and bury them in impenetrable recesses, and to entangle them in labyrinths and a thousand windings. But what was much more difficult of accomplishment, he so disguised the entrances to these as to make them most unlike what they really were. Moreover, he kept these places so close a secret with himself that he would never disclose to another the place of concealment of any Catholic. 
he alone was both their architect and their builder, working at them with inexhaustible industry and labour, for generally the thickest walls had to be broken into, and large stones excavated, requiring stronger arms than were attached to a body so diminutive as to give him the nickname of Little John, and by this his skill many priests were preserved from the prey of persecutors. Nor is it easy to find any one who has not often been indebted for his life to Owen's hiding-places. How effectually Little John's peculiar ingenuity baffled the exhaustive searches of the pursuivants or priest-hunters has been shown by contemporary accounts of the searches that took place frequently in suspected houses. Father Gerard, in his autobiography, has handed down to us many curious details of the mode of procedure upon these occasions, how the search party would bring with them skilled carpenters and masons, and try every possible expedient, from systematic measurements and soundings, to bodily tearing down the panelling and pulling up the floors. It was not an uncommon thing for a rigid search to last a fortnight, and for the pursuivants to go away empty-handed, while, perhaps, the object of the search was hidden the whole time within a wall's thickness of his pursuers, half-starved, cramped, and sore with prolonged confinement, and almost afraid to breathe, lest the least sound should throw suspicion upon the particular spot where he lay immured. After the discovery of the gunpowder plot, little John and his master, Father Garnet, were arrested at Hindlip Hall, Worcestershire, from information given to the government by Catesby's servant, Bates. Cecil, who was well aware of Owen's skill in constructing hiding-places, wrote exultingly, Great joy was caused all through the kingdom by the arrest of Owen, knowing his skill in constructing hiding-places, and the innumerable number of these dark holes which he had schemed for hiding priests throughout the kingdom. He hoped that great booty of priests— might be taken in consequence of the secrets Owen would be made to reveal, and directed that first he should be coaxed if he be willing to contract for his life, but that the secret is to be wrung from him. The horrors of the rack, however, failed in its purpose. His terrible death is thus briefly recorded by the governor of the tower at that time. The man is dead. He died in our hands. And perhaps it is as well the ghastly details did not transpire in his report. The curious old mansion, Hindlip Hall, pulled down in the early part of the last century, was erected in 1572 by John Abingdon, or Habington, whose son Thomas, the brother-in-law of Lord Monteagle, was deeply involved in the numerous plots against the Reformed religion. A long imprisonment in the tower for his futile efforts to set Mary, Queen of Scots, at liberty, far from curing the dangerous schemes of this zealous partisan of the luckless Stuart heroine, only kept him out of mischief for a time. No sooner had he obtained his freedom than he set his mind to work to turn his house in Worcestershire into a harbour of refuge for the followers of the older rites. In the quaint irregularities of the masonry, free scope was given to little John's ingenuity. Indeed, there is every proof that some of his masterpieces were constructed here. A few years before the powder plot was discovered, it was a hanging matter for a priest to be caught celebrating the Mass. Yet, with the facilities at Hindlip, he might do so with comfort, with every assurance that he had the means of evading the law. The walls of the mansion were literally riddled with secret chambers and passages. There was little fear of being run to earth with hidden exits everywhere. Wainscoting, solid brickwork, or stone hearth were equally accommodating, and would swallow up fugitives wholesale, and close over them, to open sesame again only at the hider's pleasure. CHAPTER Two, HINDLIP HALL the capture of Father Garnet and Little John, with two others, Hall and Chambers, at Hindlip, as detailed in a curious manuscript in the British Museum, gives us an insight into the search-proof merits of Abingdon's mansion. 
The document is headed, A True Discovery of the Service Performed at Hindlip, the House of Mr. Thomas Abingdon, for the Apprehension of Mr. Henry Garnet, alias Wally, Provincial of the Jesuits, and other dangerous persons, there found in January last, 1605, and runs on, after the king's royal promise of bountiful reward to such as would apprehend the traitors concerned in the powder conspiracy, and much expectation of subject-like duty, but no return made thereof in so important a matter, a warrant was directed to the right worthy and worshipful knight, Sir Henry Bromley, and the proclamation delivered therewith, describing the features and shapes of the men, for the better discovering them. He, not neglecting so weighty a business, horsing himself with a seemly troop of his own attendants, and calling to his assistance so many as in discretion was thought meet, having likewise in his company Sir Edward Bromley, on Monday, January the 20th last, by break of day, did engirt and round-beat the house of Maister Thomas Abingdon at Hindlip, near Worcester. Mr. Abingdon, not being then at home, but ridden abroad about some occasions best known to himself, the house being goodly and of great receipt, it required the more diligent labour and pains in the searching. It appeared there was no want, and Mr. Abingdon himself coming home that night, the commission and proclamation being shown unto him, he denied any such men to be in his house, and voluntarily to die at his own gate, if any such were to be found in his house or in that shire. But this liberal, or rather rash, speech could not cause the search so slightly to be given over. The cause enforced more respect than words of that or any such like nature, and proceeding on according to the trust reposed in him, in the gallery over the gate there were found two cunning and very artificial conveyances in the main brick wall, so ingeniously framed, and with such art, as it cost much labour ere they could be found. Three other secret places, contrived by no less skill and industry, were found in and about the chimneys, in one whereof two of the traitors were close concealed. These chimney conveyances being so strangely formed, having the entrances into them so curiously covered over with brick, mortared and made fast to planks of wood, and coloured black like the other parts of the chimney, that very diligent inquisition might well have passed by, without throwing the least suspicion upon such unsuspicious places. And whereas diverse funnels are usually made to chimneys according as they are combined together, and serve for necessary use in several rooms, so here were some that exceeded common expectation, seeming outwardly fit for carrying forth smoke but being further examined and seen into, their service was to no such purpose, but only to lend air and light downward into the concealments, where such as were concealed in them at any time should be hidden. Eleven secret corners and conveyances were found in the said house, all of them having books, massing stuff, and popish trumpery in them, only two excepted which appeared to have been found on former searches, and therefore had now the less credit given to them. But Maister Abingdon would take no knowledge of any of these places, nor that the books or massing stuff were any of his, until, at length, the deeds of his lands being found in one of them, whose custody, doubtless, he would not commit to any place of neglect, or where he should have no intelligence of them, whereto he could not then devise any sufficient excuse. Three days had been wholly spent, and no man found there all this while, but upon the fourth day, in the morning, from behind the wainscot in the galleries, came forth two men of their own voluntary accord, as being no longer able there to conceal themselves, for they confessed that they had but one apple between them, which was all the sustenance they had received during the time they were thus hidden. One of them was named Owen, who afterwards murdered himself in the tower, and the other Chambers, but they would take no other knowledge of any other men's being in the house. 
On the eighth day the before-mentioned place in the chimney was found, according as they had all been at several times, one after the other, though before set down together, for expressing the just number of them. Fourth of this secret and most cunning conveyance came Henry Garnet, the Jesuit, sought for, and another with him named Hall. Marmalade and other sweetmeats were found there lying by them, but their better maintenance had been by a quill or reed, through a little hole in the chimney that backed another chimney into the gentlewoman's chamber, and by that passage candles, broths, and warm drinks had been conveyed in unto them. Now in regard the place was in so close, and did much annoy them that made entrance in upon them, to whom they confessed that they had not been able to hold out one whole day longer, but either they must have squealed or perished in the place. The whole service endured the space of eleven nights and twelve days, and no more persons being there found, in company with Maister Abingdon himself, Garnet, Hall, Owen, and Chambers were brought up to London to understand further of His Highness's pleasure. That the government had good grounds for suspecting Hindlip and its numerous hiding-places may be gathered from the official instructions the Worcestershire Justice of the Peace and his search-party had to follow. The wainscoting in the east part of the parlour and in the dining-room, being suspected of screening a vault or passage, was to be removed. The walls and floor were to be pierced in all directions. Comparative measurements were to be taken between the upper and the lower rooms, and in particular the chimneys and the roof had to be minutely examined and measurements taken, which might bring to light some unaccounted-for space that had been turned to good account by the unfortunate inventor, who was eventually starved out of one of his clever contrivances. Only shortly before Owen had had a very narrow escape at Stoke Poges, while engaged in constructing priests' holes at the manor house. The secluded position of this building adapted it for the purpose for which a Roman Catholic zealot had taken it. But this was not the only advantage. The walls were of vast thickness, and offered every facility for turning them to account. While little John was busily engaged burrowing into the masonry, the dreaded pursuivants arrived. But somehow or other he slipped between their fingers and got away under cover of the surrounding woods. The wing of this old mansion, which has survived to see the twentieth century, witnessed many strange events. It has welcomed good Queen Bess, guarded the martyr king, and refused admittance to Dutch William. A couple of centuries after it had sheltered hunted Jesuits, a descendant of William Penn became possessed of it, and cleared away many of the massive walls, in some of which, who can tell? were locked up secrets that the rack failed to reveal, secrets by which Owen murdered himself in the tower. One of the hiding-places at Hindlip, it will be remembered, could be supplied with broth, wine, or any liquid nourishment through a small aperture in the wall of the adjoining room. A very good example of such an arrangement may still be seen at Urnham Hall in Lincolnshire. Footnote. The fire which destroyed a wing of Urnham Hall a few years ago fortunately did not touch that part of the building containing a hiding-place. End of footnote. A large hiding-place could thus be accommodated, but detection of the narrow iron tube by which the imprisoned fugitive could be kept alive was practically impossible. A solid oak beam, forming a step between two bedrooms, concealed a panel into which the tube was cunningly fitted and the step was so arranged that it could be removed and replaced with the greatest ease. Footnote. Harvington Hall, mentioned hereafter, has a contrivance of this kind. End of footnote. The hiding-place at Urnham, which measures eight feet by five, and about five feet six inches in height, was discovered by a tell-tale chimney that was not in the least blackened by soot or smoke. This originally gave the clue to the secret, and when the shaft of the chimney was examined, it was found to lead direct to the priest's hole, to which it afforded air and light. Had not the particular hiding-place in which Garnet and his companions sought shelter been discovered, they could well have held out the twelve days' search. 
As a rule, a small stock of provisions was kept in these places, as the visits of the search parties were necessarily very sudden and unexpected. The way down into these hidden quarters was from the floor above, through the hearth of a fireplace, which could be raised and lowered like a trap-door. In a letter from Garnet to Anne Vaux, preserved in the record office, he thus describes his precarious situation. After we had been in the hole seven days and seven nights and some odd hours, every man may well think we were well wearied, and indeed so it was, for we generally sat, save that sometimes we could half stretch ourselves, the place not being high enough, and we had our legs so straightened that we could not, sitting, find place for them, so that we both were in continuous pain of our legs, and both our legs, especially mine, were much swollen. We were very merry and content within, and heard the searchers every day most curious over us, which made me indeed think the place would be found. When we came forth we appeared like ghosts. There is an old timber-framed cottage near the modern mansion of Hindlip, which is said to have had its share in sheltering the plotters. A room is pointed out where Digby and Catesby concealed themselves, and from one of the chimneys at some time or another a priest was captured and led to execution. CHAPTER Three, PRIEST HUNTING AT BRADDOCKS In the parish of Wimbish, about six miles from Saffron Walden, stand the remains of a fine old Tudor house named Broad Oaks, or Braddocks, which in Elizabeth's reign was a noted house for priest hunting. Wandering through its ancient rooms, the imagination readily carries us back to the drama enacted here three centuries ago, with a vividness as if the events recorded had happened yesterday. The chapel and priest holes may still be seen, and a fine old stone fireplace that was stripped of its overmantel, etc., of carved oak, by the pursuivants, in their vain efforts when Father Gerard was concealed in the house. The old Essex family of Wiseman, of Braddocks, were staunch Romanists, and their home, being a noted resort for priests, received from time to time sudden visits. The dreaded Top Cliff had upon one occasion nearly brought the head of the family, an aged widow lady, to the horrors of the press-yard, but her punishment eventually took the form of imprisonment. Searches at Braddocks had brought forth hiding-places, priests, compromising papers, and armour and weapons. Let us see with what success the house was explored in the Easter of the year 1594. Gerard gives his exciting experiences as follows. The searchers broke down the door, and forcing their way in, spread through the house with great noise and racket. Their first step was to lock up the mistress of the house in her own room with her two daughters, and the Catholic servants they kept locked up in diverse places in the same part of the house. Footnote. The mistress of the house was Jane Wiseman, wife of William Wiseman. N.B. The late Cardinal Wiseman was descended from a junior branch of this family. See Life of Father John Gerard by John Morris. End footnote. They then took to themselves the whole house, which was of a good size, and made a thorough search in every part, not forgetting even to look under the tiles of the roof. The darkest corners they examined with the help of candles. Finding nothing whatever, they began to break down certain places that they suspected. They measured the walls with long rods, so that if they did not tally they might pierce the part not accounted for. Then they sounded the walls and all the floors to find out and break into any hollow places there might be. They spent two days in this work without finding anything. Thinking, therefore, that I had gone on Easter Sunday, the two magistrates went away on the second day, leaving the pursuivants to take the mistress of the house and all her Catholic servants of both sexes to London to be examined and imprisoned. They meant to leave some who were not Catholics to keep the house. The traitor, one of the servants of the house, being one of them. The good lady was pleased at this, for she hoped that he would be the means of freeing me and rescuing me from death, for she knew that I had made up my mind to suffer and die of starvation between two walls, rather than come forth and save my own life at the expense of others. In fact, during those four days that I lay hid, I had nothing to eat but a biscuit or two, 
and a little quince jelly, which my hostess had at hand and gave me as I was going in. She did not look for any more, as she supposed that the search would not last beyond a day. But now that two days were gone, and she was to be carried off on the third with all her trusty servants, she began to be afraid of my dying of sheer hunger. She bethought herself then of the traitor, who she heard was to be left behind. He had made a great fuss and show of eagerness in withstanding the searchers when they first forced their way in. For all that, she would not have let him know of the hiding-places, had she not been in such straits. Thinking it better, however, to rescue me from certain death, even at some risk to herself, she charged him, when she was taken away and every one had gone, to go into a certain room, call me by my wonted name, and tell me that the others had been taken to prison, but that he was left to deliver me. I would then answer, she said, from behind the lath and plaster where I lay concealed. The traitor promised to obey faithfully, but he was faithful only to the faithless, for he unfolded the whole matter to the ruffians who had remained behind. No sooner had they heard it than they called back the magistrates who had departed. These returned early in the morning, and renewed the search. They measured and sounded everywhere much more carefully than before, especially in the chamber above mentioned, in order to find out some hollow place. But finding nothing whatever during the whole of the third day, they proposed on the morrow to strip off the wainscot of that room. Meanwhile they set guards in all the rooms about to watch all night, lest I should escape. I heard from my hiding-place the password which the captain of the band gave to his soldiers, and I might have got off by using it, were it not that they would have seen me issuing from my retreat, for there were two on guard in the chapel where I got into my hiding-place and several also in the large wainscoted room which had been pointed out to them. But mark the wonderful providence of God! Here was I in my hiding-place. The way I got into it was by taking up the floor, made of wood and bricks, under the fireplace. The place was so constructed that a fire could not be lit in it without damaging the house, though we made a point of keeping wood there, as if it were made for a fire. Well, the men on the night watch lit a fire in this very grate, and began chatting together close to it. Soon the bricks, which had not bricks but wood underneath them, got loose, and nearly fell out of their places as the wood gave way. On noticing this, and probing the place with a stick, they found that the bottom was made of wood, whereupon they remarked that this was something curious. I thought that they were going there and then, to break open the place and enter but they made up their minds at last to put off further examination till next day. Next morning, therefore, they renewed the search most carefully, everywhere except in the top chamber which served as a chapel, and in which the two watchmen had made a fire over my head, and had noticed the strange make of the grate. God had blotted out of their memory all remembrance of the thing. Nay, none of the searchers entered the place the whole day, though it was the one which was most open to suspicion and if they had entered, they would have found me without any search. Rather, I should say, they would have seen me, for the fire had burned a great hole in my hiding-place, and had I not got a little out of the way, the hot embers would have fallen on me. The searchers, forgetting or not caring about this room, busied themselves in ransacking the rooms below, in one of which I was said to be. In fact, they found the other hiding-place which I thought of going into, as I mentioned before. It was not far off, so I could hear their shouts of joy when they first found it. But after joy comes grief, and so it was with them. The only thing that they found was a goodly store of provision laid up. Hence they may have thought that this was the place that the mistress of the house meant. In fact, an answer might have been given from it to the call of a person in the room mentioned by her. They stuck to their purpose, however, of stripping off all the wainscot of the other large room, so they set a man to work near the ceiling, close to the place where I was, for the lower part of the walls was covered with tapestry, not with wainscot. So they stripped off the wainscot all round, till they came again to the very place where I lay, and there they lost heart and gave up the search. My hiding-place was in a thick wall of the chimney, behind a finely inlaid and carved mantelpiece. They could not well take the carving down without risk of breaking it, Broken, however, it would have been, and that into a thousand pieces, had they any conception that I could be concealed behind it. But knowing that there were two flues, 
they did not think that there could be room enough there for a man. Nay, before this, on the second day of the search, they had gone into the room above, and tried the fireplace through which I had got into my hole. They then got into the chimney by a ladder, to sound with their hammers. One said to another in my hearing, Might there not be a place here for a person to get down into the wall of the chimney below, by lifting up this hearth? No, answered one of the pursuivants, whose voice I knew. You could not get down that way into the chimney underneath, but there might easily be an entrance at the back of this chimney. So saying, he gave the place a knock. I was afraid he would hear the hollow sound of the hole where I was. Seeing that their toil availed them naught, they thought that I had escaped somehow, and so they went away at the end of the four days, leaving the mistress and her servants free. The yet unbetrayed traitor stayed after the searchers were gone. As soon as the doors of the house were made fast, the mistress came to call me, another four days buried Lazarus, from what would have been my tomb had the search continued a little longer. For I was all wasted and weakened, as well with hunger as with want of sleep, and with having to sit so long in such a narrow space. After coming out I was seen by the traitor, whose treachery was still unbeknown to us. He did nothing then, not even to send after the searchers, as he knew that I meant to be off before they could be recalled. The Wisemans had another house at North End, a few miles to the southeast of Dunmo. Here were also priests' holes, one of which, in a chimney, secreted a certain Father Brewster during a rigid search in December 1593. Great Harrowden, near Wellingborough, the ancient seat of the Vaux family, was another notorious sanctuary for persecuted recusants. Gerard spent much of his time here in apartments specially constructed for his use and upon more than one occasion had to have recourse to the hiding-places. Some four or five years after his experiences at Braddock's, he narrowly escaped his pursuers in this way, and in 1605, when the pursuivants were scouring the country for him, as he was supposed to be privy to the gunpowder plot, he owed his life to a secret chamber at Harrowden. The search-party remained for nine days. Night and day men were posted round the house, and every approach was guarded within a radius of three miles. With the hope of getting rid of her unwelcome guests, Lady Vaux revealed one of the priest's holes, to prove there was nothing in her house beyond a few prohibited books. But this did not have the desired effect, so the unfortunate inmate of the hiding-place had to continue in a cramped position, there being no room to stand up, for four or five days more. His hostess, however, managed to bring him food, and moments were seized during the latter days of the search to get him out that he might warm his benumbed limbs by a fire. While these things were going on at Harrowden, another priest, little thinking into whose hands the well-known sanctuary had fallen, came thither to seek shelter, but was seized and carried to an inn, whence it was intended that he should be removed to London on the following day. But he managed to outwit his captors. To evade suspicion he threw off his cloak and sword, and under a pretext of giving his horse drink at a stream close by the stable, seized a lucky moment, mounted, and dashed into the water, swam across, and galloped off to the nearest house that could offer the convenience of a hiding-place. At Hackney the Vaux family had another residence with its chapel and priest's hole, the latter having a masked entrance high up in the wall, which led to a space under a gable projection of the roof. For double security this contained yet an inner hiding-place. In the existing brook house are incorporated the modernized remains of this mansion. Chapter 4 The Gunpowder Plot Conspirators Lord Vaux of Harrowden, Sir William Catesby of Ashby St. Ledgers, and Sir Thomas Tresham of Rushton Hall, all in Northamptonshire, were upon more than one occasion arraigned before the court of the Star Chamber for harbouring Jesuits. The old mansions Ashby St. Ledgers and Rushton fortunately still remain intact, and preserve many traditions of Romanist plots. Sir William Catesby's son Robert, the chief conspirator, is said to have held secret meetings in the curious oak-panelled room over the gatehouse of the former, which goes by the name of the Plot Room. Once upon a time it was provided with a secret means of escape. At Rushton Hall, a hiding-place was discovered in 1832 behind a lintel over a doorway. It was full of bundles of manuscripts, 
prohibited books, and incriminating correspondence of the conspirator Tresham. Another place of concealment was situated in the chimney of the great hall, and in this Father Oldcorn was hidden for a time. Gayhurst, or Gothurst, in Buckinghamshire, the seat of St. Everard Digby, also remains intact, one of the finest late Tudor buildings in the country. Unfortunately, however, only recently a remarkable priest's hole that was here has been destroyed in consequence of modern improvements. It was a double hiding-place, one situated beneath the other, the lower one being so arranged as to receive light and air from the bottom portion of a large mullioned window, a most ingenious device. A secret passage in the hall had communication with it, and entrance was obtained through part of the flooring of an apartment, the movable part of the boards revolving upon pivots, and sufficiently solid to vanquish any suspicion as to a hollow space beneath. As may be supposed, tradition says that at the time of Digby's arrest he was dragged forth from this hole, but history shows that he was taken prisoner at Holbeach House, where it will be remembered the conspirators Catesby and Percy were shot, and led to execution. For a time Digby sought security at Cowton Court, the seat of the Throckmortons in Warwickshire. The house of this old Roman Catholic family, of course, had its hiding-holes, one of which remains to this day. Holbeach, as well as Hagley Hall, the homes of the Littletons, have been rebuilt. The latter was pulled down in the middle of the eighteenth century. Here it was that Stephen Littleton and Robert Winter were captured through the treachery of the cook. Grant's house, Norbrook, in Warwickshire, has also given way to a modern one. Ambrose Rookwood's seat, Coldham Hall, near Bury St. Edmunds, exists and retains its secret chapel and hiding-places. There are three of the latter. One of them, now a small withdrawing-room, is entered from the oak wainscoted hall. When the house was in the market a few years ago, the priest's holes duly figured in the advertisements with the rest of the apartments and offices. It read a little odd, this juxtaposition of modern conveniences with what is essentially romantic, and we simply mention the fact to show that the auctioneer is well aware of the monetary value of such things. At the time of the gunpowder conspiracy, Rookwood rented Clopton Hall near Stratford-on-Avon. This house also has its little chapel in the roof with adjacent priest's holes, but many alterations have taken place from time to time. Who does not remember William Howitt's delightful description, or, to be correct, the description of a lady correspondent, of the old mansion before these restorations? "'There was the old Catholic chapel,' she wrote, "'with a chaplain's room, which had been walled up and forgotten till within the last few years.' I went in on my hands and knees, for the entrance was very low. I recollect a little in the chapel, but in the chaplain's room were old and, I should think, rare editions of many books, mostly folios. A large yellow paper copy of Dryden's All for Love or The World Well Lost, date 1686, caught my eye, and is the only one I particularly remember. Huddington Court the picturesque old home of the Winters, of whom Robert and Thomas lost their lives for their share in the plot, stands a few miles from Droitwich. A considerable quantity of arms and ammunition were stored in the hiding-places here, in 1605, in readiness for general rising. Two other houses may be mentioned in connection with the memorable plot, houses that were rented by the conspirators as convenient places of rendezvous, on account of their hiding-places and masked exits for escape. One of them stood in the vicinity of the Strand, in the fields behind St. Clement's Inn. Father Gerard had taken it some time previous to the discovery of the plot, and with Owen's aid some very secure hiding-places were arranged. This he had done with two or three other London residences so that he and his brother priests might use them upon hazardous occasions. And to one of these he owed his life when the hue and cry after him was at its highest pitch. By removing from one to the other they avoided detection, though they had many narrow escapes. One priest was celebrating Mass when the Lord Mayor and Constables suddenly burst in, but the surprise party was disappointed. Nothing could be detected beyond the smoke of the extinguished candles. 
and in addition to the hole where the fugitive crouched, there were two other secret chambers, neither of which was discovered. On another occasion a priest was left shut up in a wall. His friends were taken prisoners, and he was in danger of starvation, until at length he was rescued from his perilous position, carried to one of the other houses, and again immured in the vault or chimney. The other house was White Webb's, on the confines of Enfield Chase. In the record office there is a document describing how many popish books and relics were discovered when the latter was searched. The building was full of trap-doors and secret passages. Some vestiges of the outbuildings of White Webb's may still be seen in a quaint little inn called the King and Tinker. But of all the narrow escapes, perhaps Father Blount's experiences at Scotney Castle were the most thrilling. This old house of the Darrells, situated on the border of Kent and Sussex, like Hindlip and Braddock's and most of the residences of the Roman Catholic gentry, contained the usual lurking-places for priests. The structure as it now stands is in the main modern, having undergone from time to time considerable alterations. A vivid account of Blount's hazardous escape here is preserved among the monuments at Stonyhurst, a transcript of the original, formerly at St. Omer's. One Christmas night, towards the close of Elizabeth's reign, the castle was seized by a party of priest-hunters, who, with their usual mode of procedure, locked up the members of the family securely before starting on their operations. In the inner quadrangle of the mansion was a very remarkable and ingenious device. A large stone of the solid wall could be pushed aside. Though of immense weight, it was so nicely balanced and adjusted that it required only a slight pressure upon one side to effect an entrance to the hiding-place within. Those who have visited the grounds at Chatsworth may remember a huge piece of solid rock which can be swung round in the same easy manner. Upon the approach of the enemy, Father Blount and his servant hastened to the courtyard and entered the vault, but in their hurry to close the weighty door a small portion of one of their girdles got jammed in, so that a part was visible from the outside. Fortunately for the fugitives, someone in the secret, in passing the spot, happened to catch sight of this tell-tale fragment, and immediately cut it off. But as a particle still showed, they called gently to those within, to endeavour to pull it in, which they eventually succeeded in doing. At this moment the pursuivants were at work in another part of the castle, but hearing the voice in the courtyard, rushed into it and commenced battering the walls, and at times upon the very door of the hiding-place, which would have given way had not those within put their combined weight against it, to keep it from yielding. It was a pitchy dark night, and it was pelting with rain, so after a time, discouraged at finding nothing, and wet to the skin, the soldiers put off further search until the following morning, and proceeded to dry and refresh themselves by the fire in the great hall. When all was at rest, Father Blount and his man, not caring to risk another day's hunting, cautiously crept forth barefooted, and after managing to scale some high walls, dropped into the moat and swam across. And it was as well for them that they decided to quit their hiding-hole, for next morning it was discovered. The fugitives found temporary security at another recusant house a few miles from Scotney, possibly the old half-timber house of Twissenden, where a secret chapel and adjacent priest's holes are still pointed out. The original manuscript account of the search at Scotney was written by one of the Darrell family, who was in the castle at the time of the events recorded.